uh, good morning everyone and welcome back to this course. So, uh, today's topic uh, query optimization. There is a lot of uh, material in this uh, chapter, uh, but I am not going to have time to cover all the slides um, because uh, we have had other interesting questions. So, what I am going to do is cover the first uh, maybe half of the slides here and then just give you a very quick overview of uh, what else is there in this chapter. So, uh, the basic issue in query optimization is, well there are two issues. The first issue is given a query, how do you execute it? What are the options for executing it? And the options for executing it are actually at two levels. One is logically equivalent expressions uh, at the relation algebra level. The second is options at the algorithmic level, should you use hash join, merge join, index nested loop join. So, both of these put together give a wide range of options for executing a single given query. The second issue is for all these options, how do you figure out which is the cheapest way? I want to find the cheapest way. Why do I want to find the cheapest way? It turns out if you choose the wrong option, you may take an enormous amount of time, whereas the cheapest option may be extremely fast. The difference can be many, many orders of magnitude. For example, if you did a really dumb thing, and executed an SQL query by taking a cross product of the relations in the from clause and then do the selection uh, and the relations have millions of tuples, uh, you are going to take a minimum of a million million operations which even on the fastest computer will take ages to finish, completely ridiculous way of doing it. In contrast, if you do it the right way, you may finish in a matter of seconds or uh, even on a million uh, records, a few seconds is quite normal. Uh, with good machines and good database systems. So, the question is how do you estimate the cost and then from among the alternatives, how do you efficiently find the best one or something which is uh, good uh, close to the best one and pick it within a very short period of time. So, that is the challenge for query optimization. So, we split the area into several parts, one is transformation, the second is catalog information for cost estimation, uh, including statistical information, how to do the uh, cost estimation and then how do you use cost based optimization uh, using dynamic programming and then a little bit about maintenance of materialized views. Most probably I will not get to this last part at all today, you, but you can read it later. Okay, so, here is an example of a single query. What is this query doing? It is joining teachers and course and then joining that with instructor and then selecting department equal to music. Uh, this query finds those who are teaching courses um, and joins it with instructor. Since these are all natural joins, uh, this query is actually going to find instructors in the music department who teach courses in the music department. Um, that is uh, what this query does. Now, I can take this selection on department name equal to music and push it down into instructor. So, instead of first joining and then um, finding uh, eliminating those which are not in music, I can do this up front and select only those instructors who are in music and then uh, meanwhile join all of teachers and course out here, join all of teachers and course and then join that with instructors from the music department. So, you can see that the right hand side is going to be better than the left hand side most probably, because we have eliminated irrelevant instructors early. But is the right hand side the best possible plan? As a human, you can notice that we are actually taking courses from uh, departments which are not music, joining them with teachers and then propagating it and finally, we are filtering those out here in this next join. So, as a human you would say that is probably a bad idea, why do not we ahead of time filter out courses which are not in the music department over here. So, we can filter out instructors who are not music, courses which are not in music and then do a join. So, this part which says do selections as early as possible is an example of a heuristic which humans would use to optimize a query and optimizers also do use such heuristics. Why postpone a selection if you can do it early? You will definitely reduce the sizes of intermediate results. But there is another part which is a lot harder for humans to do. Should we take a plan 
which first joins teachers with course and then join it with instructor, which is on this side, even with the selections. Or should we take a different plan, which joins instructor with teachers and then join it with course? Or should we join instructor with course and then with teachers? The last one is actually a bad idea, because instructor and course do not have any attribute in common. If you join them, it is really a cross product. You can do it, but it is going to be very inefficient. But there are two other choices here. Now, that does not sound like a lot, but the number of choices actually grows exponentially with the number of relations. And it is very hard for a human to go over all the alternatives and pick which is the best one. But it is relatively easy for a query optimizer to go over the exponential number of choices. Now, note that typically queries have you know 6, 8, 10 is already on the high side relations. So, exponential 2 power 10 is 1000, even if uh, the exponent is 3, which is, is if you expand the search space. 3 power 10 is bigger, but it is still certainly doable within a uh, few uh, milliseconds or a second for any modern computer. So, an uh, optimizer can go over these alternatives much better than a human can. Okay. So, now, uh, the actual plan which is executed, an evaluation plan, uh, requires both an algebraic expression, which is joins, selects, projects, aggregates, but also which operation to use. So, what we are going to actually evaluate at the end is what is called an evaluation plan, or it is also sometimes referred to as an annotated um, relation algebra expression. So, here is an example. This defines a fairly complete evaluation plan. The thing over here says um, take course and project it on course ID title, and then join it with teachers using hash join. There is one more link in here which says pipeline it. What does pipeline mean? Uh, this is actually some material from yesterday, uh, which I did not get to cover. It is at the end of the um, query processing section. And uh, I will let you read it offline for lack of time. But the idea of pipelining is um, when you get a tuple from the projection over here, you do not write it to disk. Instead, you pass it directly up to the next operator. This cannot always be done. Sometimes you have to write something to disk and then read it back in later, because the next operator will not be running at the same time. It will be running afterwards. But your query plan can be constructed in many cases such that two operators, in this case join and project, are actually running concurrently. Meaning, if you have one CPU, then only one will run at a time. But the idea is that uh, the hash join can tell the projection, give me a tuple now. And the projection will create a tuple and give it back to the hash join. In fact, here uh, there is also a sort, uh, and the sort can tell the hash join, give me a tuple now, and the hash join will in turn get tuples from teachers and um, course, do the partitioning, take the first partition, and then uh, generate a tuple, and then pass it back up to the sort. And then the sort will keep doing this, they give me one more tuple, give me one more tuple, and hash join will generate further tuples one by one. Okay. So, this is uh, uh, basically an iterator. Uh, let me write out the term here on the whiteboard. So, this is the iterator model, where each operator has a few functions. There is an open function, just like a file open. The operator initializes it. So, what are the operators? Join, for example, hash join, merge join, and so on. All the operators have provide all these functions. Then there is a next, which says, give me the next tuple of that result. And finally, there is a close. You will notice that this is very similar to how you read data from a file. You open the file, read, 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 read one of maybe a line at a time, and then you close the file. So, similarly, you open an expression in the tree, read data from it, one after another by calling next, and then close it when you are done with it. So, um, this model is actually very nicely suited to pipelining. That is, the operators can uh, be executing concurrently, 
the, uh, if there are multiple cores, they actually run in parallel. But usually, what happens is um, one operator runs. It's a function call on one operator, and let's say here the join. There's a function call on join, and the join in turn does a function call, uh, which invokes the project operator. The project operator generates one tuple and returns it. When join calls it again for one more tuple, it will return the next tuple and so on. So, obviously, each operator has some notion of state. It says, what was the last thing I returned and what should I do next if I am called again to return the next tuple? What should I do to return the next tuple? So, all of this is part of the iterator uh, model uh, of pipeline development. Query evaluation. It turns out this is a very, very basic model, and every database system supports it simply because writing out results to disk in between is very expensive. So, the alternative to pipeline is what is called materialized evaluation. So, what is materialized evaluation? In materialized evaluation, each operator, in this case a project, will generate its entire output and write it to a file, to a temporary place and store it. Now, let us say this was some other thing, this was a selection. So, the selection will in turn uh, generate its entire output and write it to a file. Then the join operator will take these two temporary relations, join it and write its output to a file, to a temporary relation basically. And each operator keeps doing this, going from the bottom of the tree upwards. So, that is called materialized evaluation. Um, a materialized evaluation is more expensive uh, because of reads and writes. So, wherever possible, a database system would do pipelining without writing in out results temporarily. This is not always possible. So, the query plan is annotated with edges saying pipeline or not. If the edge does not say pipeline, that would mean generate the result, store it, and then the next operator will take it. Okay. So, coming back here, uh, on this side, there is a select department name equal to music. This is annotated with use index 1. So, we are telling it use this particular index to fetch instructor records with department name equal to music. Then the next thing, it is pipeline into the sort operation. Now, the sort operation is a bit funny. The sort operation cannot output any of its results until it has consumed all its input. So, the sort operation will have to completely evaluate its input before it returns even one result upwards. So, you can think of the sort as a kind of barrier. It completely finishes evaluation more or less, there is some extensions and then starts outputting results. Okay. So, now the output of sort is uh, sent to merge join uh, and the output of this sort on this side is also sent to merge join. And merge join gets those tuples uh, in a pipeline fashion and outputs them to the join result. And finally, that is sent up to the last project. And here, uh, if this were a select distinct in SQL, we have to remove duplicates. So, this project is annotated with a thing saying sort to remove duplicates. So, it has to sort its input uh, to remove duplicates before outputting it. So, that is a complete execution plan. So, the bullet at the bottom of this slide says find out how to view query execution plans in your favorite database. In fact, your lab uh, for today uh, is uh, you are going to look at query execution plans in PostgreSQL. So, how do you uh, see query plans? Uh, in PostgreSQL, it is actually very easy. Whatever query you wanted to execute, you simply prefix it with the word explain. So, explain select star from something explain insert into something, something, whatever is the SQL query. Put an explain in front and PostgreSQL will show you a plan. Um, so, I will let you uh, try this out and see what are the plans you get. Other databases have other syntax. Uh, we will not get into it here. You can read it if you want. So, uh, as I was hinting at the beginning, uh, this uh, it's a huge difference in plan costs and cost based optimization uh, basically has three steps. First, it generates logically equivalent expressions using equivalence rules. Second, 
uh, it annotates the resultant expressions to get alternative query plans. These are fully annotated with the exact operations, uh, hash, index lookup, whatever. And then choose the cheapest plan in a, based on the estimated cost. And the estimation, as I said, is based on statistics such as number of tuples, number of distinct values for an attribute, uh, and so on. Then there is an issue of, um, you know, for the given relations, you may have computed the statistics of number of tuples and number of distinct values. But if you have a complex expression, for the cost of each operation, I need to know statistics about its input. But its input is actually an expression. So, how do I know the statistics of an expression? So, the second part is statistics estimation for intermediate results. What statistics? Just the above ones usually. Number of tuples, number of distinct values and often also histograms. Now, once you have these statistics, we can estimate the cost of various algorithms. We already saw yesterday how to estimate the cost of uh, most of the algorithms. Those require uh, typically the uh, number of tuples in the input, the sizes of the tuples, the number of blocks that the relations occupy and such like. So, the first step is how do you generate equivalent expressions? So, what do we mean by equivalent first of all? So, two relational algebra expressions are said to be equivalent if the two relations generate the same set of tuples on every legal database instance. What do we mean by legal database instance? one which satisfies all the integrity constraints specified on the database. Um, you can have two expressions which may return different results if a primary key constraint is violated, but we do not care. When, as long as the two return the same result with the primary key constraint, we are fine, because anyway the primary key constraint is enforced. Also, what do we mean by same result? First of all, the order in which tuples are output is irrelevant. If you need order at the end of your query, anyway there is an order by clause which will enforce the order. So, we do not, we allow, uh, we treat expressions as equivalent without caring about any ordering of the result. Now, this notion said same set of tuples, but in SQL it is actually not just a set, it is a multi set. What is the difference? In a set, each tuple occurs only once. In a multi set, a tuple can occur twice. So, let us take one multi set where a particular set uh, tuple occurs twice, another multi set which is identical except this one tuple occurs three times. These two multi sets are not the same. Two multi sets would be the same if first of all they have the same set of tuples and second if the tuple occurs n times in one, it must occur exactly n times in the other also. So, that is when two multi sets are equivalent. So, what we really need in the context of SQL is multi set equivalence of the multi set relational algebra rules. So, now an equivalence rule says that two expressions of two forms are equivalent. So, let us see an example. Take the very first one. Uh, this one says, if I had a selection which had two conditions, for example, a uh, selection which said age equal to 5 and city equal to Mumbai, that is the selection condition. Now, this says I can split it into a sequence of two selections. So, now I can split it into a select operation, which selects city equal to Mumbai, get the results. On that, I apply the selection age equal to 5 and that is my final result and they are going to be exactly equivalent. So, that is an example of an equivalence rule. So, coming back here, the bottom line says, we can replace an expression of the first form by the second or vice versa. This is an important issue in equivalence rules. We are not saying necessarily that doing it like this is better than doing it like this or vice versa. Either may be the cheapest. In fact, uh, the cost may be the same, but doing this transformation may be useful to do some other transformation subsequently, which may reduce the cost. In fact, it could be even more uh, tricky. It may be worth going from this form to that form, even though the cost is higher, because subsequently we can do more transformations and come up with a cheaper final result. So, the optimizer will actually usually blindly apply this equivalence. So, if you get this form, add the other as an alternative. If you get this form, add the first one as an alternative. So, you 
collect the number of alternatives, that is the idea. The second equivalence rule is again fairly simple. It says that selection operations are commutative. What does this mean? As an example, uh, I said age equal to 5 and city equal to Mumbai. I can do it as a sequence which first says city equal to Mumbai, gets the results, then applies age equal to 5 or I can reverse it. I can first do age equal to 5, get the result and on that I can apply city equal to Mumbai. It does not matter which order I do it, the result is the same. So, the select operation is commutative, that is what this rule say, you can flip the selections. Uh, then there are other uh, uh, rules such as uh, this one about projection, which I am going to skip. Um, but let me move on to the more interesting rule. This 4 A says that a selection on a join, on a Cartesian product is really the same as a join. So, here a select on E 1 cross product E 2 is the same as E 1 join E 2 with the join condition theta, which came from the selection. You can see that this is a very important rule. The original SQL query really had a cross product of all the relations in the from clause. The idea here is if I have a selection on a cross product, I can push it in and turn it into a join condition. So, I do not need to evaluate the cross product first and then apply the selection. I can evaluate the join with this condition instead and that is a lot more efficient. So, 4 A is a very, very important rule for any optimizer. 4 B is another one which says that if I have a selection on top of a existing join, I can take this selection condition and push it into the join and apply that ahead of time. So, there are many more such rules which are positive uh, possible. The next two rules are also very, very important rules. The first rule says that join operations are commutative. What does this mean? It says E 1 join theta E 2 is the same as E 2 join theta of E 1. Well, there is a slight uh, trick here. If you do this in SQL, the order in which the columns appear gets flipped, uh, but that is a minor issue. Um, we can deal with that very easily um, by reordering the columns. So, we will treat them as equivalent. So, first of all, we can flip the left and right input to any join operation. The second one says that natural join operations are associative. What does associative mean? So, here is what it means. If I first join E 1 and E 2, take the result and join with E 3, natural join. This rule says that it is entirely equivalent to first joining E 2, E 3 and then joining with E 1. So, um, the order in which you do the joins for natural joins is irrelevant. In fact, if you uh, take these two rules together, what they actually tell us, uh, let me use the whiteboard to explain that. So, these two rules allow us to, um, so commutativity plus associativity together can be used to show the following. If I have any uh, set of joints. Okay. It holds for natural joints and for other joints, but to keep life simple, let me stick to natural joints for the moment. So, I have any expression uh, E 1 join E 2 join E 3 join E 4 and maybe to make it unambiguous, I have parenthesized it like this. Um, I join first I join E 2, E 3, then I join with E 1 and then I do the join with E 4. Now, with these two rules which are given, we can actually infer that we can do it in any order. So, in fact, um, this corresponds to a tree where, uh, let me get this, this is E 4 and then E 1, E 2, E 3 each node in this tree is a join. Okay. So, this is called a join tree. So, what these two rules say is that you can take any tree which you want with uh, in this case there are four relations being joined. So, take any binary tree 
which has four leaves. So, what are examples of binary trees with four leaves? Here is one example. Here is another example. Okay. See that this also has four leaves. The leaves are here. I am not showing the leaves, but the tips of these lines are the leaves. So, here are two. Now, there are many more such trees actually. Now, I can take any tree and I can put any of these four relations. I have E 1 through E 4. I can make this E 1, E 2, E 3, E 4. It may not be very clear because uh, there is not much space here, but these are this is one particular order. I can take any other order. I can do E 1, E 3, E 4, E 2. So, I can put any relation I want to any leaf of any tree. And what we can show is that the final result is going to be identical except for column ordering, which we can easily uh, move around as we want later. So, the moral of this story is that given any uh, natural join expression, you can pick any one of these join orders. How many such join orders are there? It turns out there are a lot of join orders. If you consider every possible tree like this, that itself is very large, it is exponential. In fact, it is factorial. Uh, uh, and then the number of uh, ways in which you can stick uh, relations into the leaf is also factorial. So, the overall thing is very, very large. It is ridiculously large. So, we cannot actually generate all of these. It's, it will take forever. So, it is not actually practical to generate all the alternatives and then pick the best. That is the first moral of this story. So, what you need are clever algorithms which will let you find the best join order efficiently. And it turns out join order optimizations is absolutely critical. A wrong join order can be very, very slow. A good join order can make the query run much faster. So, database optimizers have put a lot of effort into join order optimization. So, given a set of relations which are joined, how do you find the best way to join it? Now, in the join orders, I just told you it is a join. But actually, you have a choice of hash join, merge join, nested loop join, blah, blah, blah. So, how do you make that choice? So, I have to take all that into account and get the best join order with the join algorithm specified. That is a very, very important task for an optimizer. And the first optimizer which actually solved this problem was the system R, IBM system R optimizer. And that uh, the paper where they described the uh, system R optimizer is considered one of the classic papers in uh, database area, in fact, in computer science in general, because before that people did not know how to do this effectively. These people showed how to do it. And after that, SQL uh, systems could take off, because now there was a reasonably efficient way of finding the best join order which is something even a human would have had trouble doing, but databases could now do that quite effectively. So, that is the history. Coming back, um, these two rules let basically let us show that uh, the join order can be anything and the result is the same. Now, that was for natural joins. In fact, the same kind of rules hold with joins which have a join condition. What is a theta join? It is a join with a condition. So, for example, uh, R join S, where R dot A equal to S dot A. That join condition is R dot A equal to S dot A. So, that is what I refer to by theta here, down here. The theta is some condition used to uh, equate or relate attributes from the left input to the attributes from the right input. So, that is a theta refers to any join condition. So, what this rule says is, um, if I have a join like this with various conditions, I can rewrite it like this by using associativity. Um, if you note here, I am joining E 1, E 2 first, then with E 3. On this side, I am joining E 2, E 3 first and then with E 1. The only issue is which conditions apply where. The problem is um, the conditions here theta 2 and theta 3, uh, some of them use attributes from E 1 some may use attributes from E 2 and some may use attributes from both. So, what we are saying here is theta 2 
involves only attributes from E2 and E3, that part can be used here to, as the join condition for E2, E3, and then theta 3 can be used later on because it involves attributes from E1. So, that is an example of associativity. Now, if, if you do not understand the details of all this theta fully, that is ok. As long as you understood the natural join case, that intuition is good enough, do not worry about this one. So, we can depict these rules pictorially. So, this says a tree like this is equivalent to a tree like this, where E 1 and E 2 have been flipped. This one says a tree like this, where E 2, E 1 are joined first, then with E 3 is equivalent to joining E 2, E 3 first, then joining with E 1. And this rule is another rule, which is um, coming up, which says, if I had a selection on top of a join, and that selection actually involved only attributes from one of the relations E 1 in this case, then I can apply the selection ahead of the join. I do not have to wait for the join, I can do it ahead. In fact, this should be familiar. The first example we saw today had a department equal to music and we saw that the it was on top of a join. We had a join on top of it department equal to music. So, we saw that below is instructor, which has the department attribute. So, we can push the selection down and get only instructors of the music department, then do the join. So, this as I said is a very important optimization also. So, that is rule 7 a, which says if a join is, uh, if a selection is above a join and it only involves attributes of one of the relations, push it down to this form, directly apply it on the relation, then do the join. So, that was uh, 7 a, we saw it pictorially, it is shown textually here. There are variants of these rules, uh, for lack of time, I will not cover them here, 7 b is a small variant, you can read it offline. So, there are other rules in the book, we have not even shown all the rules here. Uh, they include pushing projections through joins, that is uh, throwing away unnecessary attributes early on, instead of carrying it all through an evaluation plan. Uh, that is one class. Then there is another class of equivalences involving uh, set operators, associativity, commutativity and others with set operations. And similarly, how uh, selection and projection can be uh, moved around with set operation. We saw how a selection on a join can go down below the join. Similarly, a selection on a union can be done below the union, run the selection already, then do the union. So, those kinds of rules are also there. So, there are many rules, um, we are not going to list all of them here. So, each rule does one single step. Overall, in the context of optimization, we have to apply multiple rules. So, here is an example, um, which uh, we saw before, which uh, does multiple transformations. So, a selection on a join, what has happened here? multiple things have happened. First of all, uh, if you see here, teachers was joined with course, then with instructor. On this side, instructor is joined with teachers and then with course. So, what has happened here? How could we get this? We could have got it with associativity. Remember, associativity twisted the tree around. So, if we apply associativity here, we would get instructor join teachers and then join with course. So, that is one rule which is applied, but that does not give us the result yet. It only gets the correct join order. In fact, to get the right join order, we may have to apply associativity, commutativity multiple times. Then, the selection which is here has been pushed down. In fact, if you note here, uh, if you had this and the selection above, the selection would first be pushed on top of the join. Then you will realize that, well, it can be pushed through this join as well. So, it is pushed through one join, then further to the next join, till it lines up directly at instructor, this selection. Similarly, year equal to 2009 applies to teachers. So, it will go down here and then down here, till it lines up here. The point is, not that the system magically knew that this was the best plan, but the point is that, by applying these transformations, you can get many, many, many expressions. 
this was one example. We can't list all of them here. It would take forever. But what we have done is, we have shown a sequence of transformations, which let us land up with a plan, which we believe is good. There are many, many more transformations, which will land up at many other plans, some of which will be good, some of which will be bad, some will be atrocious. We need to select from amongst all these alternatives based on costs. So, that is an important part of um, optimization. So, I have been talking for a long time now. So, let us give a short quiz break which is the following. Here is an expression, select r dot a equal to 5 on r join s, where the schemas are r a b and s b c. So, uh, the join condition is r dot a equal to s dot b. It is a natural join, remember. Okay. So, this expression is equivalent to which of these four alternatives. The first one is select r dot a equal to 5 on r do that first, then join with s. The next is select r dot a equal to 5 on s, then join with r. The third option is neither, both are wrong, they are not equivalent to the original. And the last option is both 1 and 2 are equivalent to the um, original query. So, those are the alternatives. Participants, please make sure you press the st button now. Okay, so, please choose your option. 1 through 4 or A through D and you have about 40 seconds. Okay, time is almost up. Please make sure you have selected an answer and time is up. So, the answer to this question was something we just saw. We can apply a selection below a join, we can push it down provided the selection condition is on that relation and that is exactly what the first option is. We had a select r dot a equal to 5. So, we could do that uh, on r before doing the join. So, 1 is what we just saw, it is correct. How about 2? It is select r dot a equal to 5 on s. That actually is meaningless. How can you select r dot a on s where the attribute is not even present? So, it is actually a simple syntax error. So, that is wrong. 3 is obviously wrong because 1 is right, 4 is wrong because 2 is not right. So, the final answer is 1 and let us see how people have done. A lot of centers did not even upload. Please check uh, all centers, uh, but of those centers which did upload, we have had a good response, 138 responded and the options, if you can see it now, uh, option 1 one uh, the majority. So, once again the audience poll, uh, the audience wins, but quite a few members of the audience have chosen two or both. So, uh, I guess you missed the small trick here that it is actually a syntax error. It does not make sense to push it on s, r dot a equal to 5 on s means nothing or perhaps you got confused by the parenthesis uh, or the lack of parenthesis. So, when you have a selection on S join with R, it obviously means you first do the selection, then the join, not the other way. Okay. Moving ahead, um, when you have different join orders possible, uh, there are some heuristics which humans used to use. Uh, for example, um, if I have R 1 join, R 2 join, R 3, where R 1 is small, but R 2, R 3 are large. So, if I join R 2, R 3, maybe it will be a very large relation, but perhaps when I join R 1, R 2, the result is very small. Maybe R 1 had a selection, uh, which eliminated a lot of tuples. In which case, uh, I will try to avoid joining R 2, R 3, which has a very large result. And this one, R 1, R 2 may be small, joining that with R 3 may also be small. So, obviously, that would be a better solution. So, that is a motivation for join order optimization. And there are examples here, which are intuitive, which say, uh, if you have this one, department name equal to music instructor, only a fraction of the instructors are going to be in music. Uh, so, it is better to join in those few instructors with teachers and then join it with course, because then we will not unnecessarily generate teachers course pairs for people who are not even in the music department. So, that 
that is probably a good join order. So, how do you find a good join order? There are two alternatives uh, which different databases follow. One alternative is to use equivalence rules as we saw them to systematically generate expressions which are equivalent to the given expression. So, it turns out that doing this is actually quite difficult. Uh, people took a while to figure out how to do this efficiently. Uh, there was a, a project in Wisconsin which tried to use equivalence rules and when they implemented it, they found it was very inefficient. Uh, but what happened is the person who did his PhD on implementing it and in the at the end of his PhD, he found it was not very efficient. Uh, he was a very smart guy and it took him some time to figure out how to do it efficiently. So, uh, he had actually graduated and was a professor um, at that point and he came up with this very, very nice algorithm to efficiently evaluate, uh, uh, to efficiently enumerate uh, expressions and find the best one in a time which is much, much less than actually enumerating all the orders. It is a very, very clever piece of work called the volcano optimizer and the person's name is Goods uh, Grafer. So, he subsequently uh, joined uh, Microsoft and uh, his work actually is used in the Microsoft query optimizer and it is also used in Sybase and a few other places. In contrast, most of the people went along with the old system R style optimization, which does not use equivalence rules at all. They are conceptual. In the optimizer, there is no explicit uh, system of enumerating equivalent expressions using the equivalence rules. Instead, what the system R optimizer does, it, it focuses totally on join order optimization. It does not look at anything else almost. Well, it does worry about selections and what it says is selection should be pushed down. Do it as fast as possible. If I say select department name equal to music, I will enforce it wherever department name occurs. If it is in the instructor relation, right at when I read the instructor relation, I will filter out things which are not music. So, what it does is it pushes down selections always and then it focuses on selecting the best join order. So, uh, we do not have time to get into all the details, um, but at the end I will briefly sketch an algorithm which can be used to find the best join order um, fairly efficiently. Before I get to that, I am going to spend a little bit of time on cost estimation, um, where uh, we have to find the cost of operators and the statistics of operators. Now, this is a little more uh, complicated. It is not very hard. Uh, you can get a fairly good estimate, but it is not precise. What do we mean by this? An estimate is an estimate. You know, if you look at all our uh, civil projects in India, uh, you routinely read in the papers that there was a cost overrun. So, somebody estimated at the beginning it would cost 10 crores, but by the time it was finished, the cost escalated to 20 crores. So, the estimation was wrong. Now, in civil projects, usually the estimation errors are because the price of uh, steel and cement went up or because the project uh, you know, took 5 years to complete instead of 3 and the cost of labor went up. So, various reasons are there. In the context of databases, uh, what can go wrong? First of all, statistics are approximate. Second, even if you have all the statistics, uh, identical statistics, there may be cases where the data is such that um, some things are correlated. So, to give you an example, uh, supposing I have a selection condition which says, um, let us say department equal to computer science and uh, on instructor relation, department is computer science and age is less than 50. Now, the same sort of query might run on another department, uh, mechanical engineering and age less than 50. They look identical. Uh, if you take the statistics for age, I have some idea of the distribution of ages. If I look at the statistics for department, I have some idea of how many people are there in each department. So, now I have this combined query, department is C s age less than 50 and another query, department is mechanical and age less than 50. If I had 
combined statistics for department and age, I could estimate this correctly. But it may be too expensive to store so much statistics, to compute them first and then to store it. So, what most database systems would do is they would have an idea of what fraction of people are in computer science department, what fraction are in mechanical. Similarly, it would have an idea of the distribution of ages. So, what an optimizer would do is it will say, well, one tenth of the people are in CS and uh, among instructors, two thirds are less than 50 years. So, I will estimate that one tenth times two thirds, which is 2 by 30, is the fraction of instructors who satisfy department is CS and uh, age less than 50. It will do the same thing for mechanical also, because it does not know anything better. It, mechanical also is one tenth and age distribution it thinks is the same. But in reality, the age distribution may be very different. It may be that computer science is a new department and there are lot of young people. Actually, this is no longer true, but some years ago it was true. Whereas, mechanical is an old department. It has been around for a long time. So, most of the faculty there are much older. So, the query estimates would be identical for the two, but the actual result of the query could be very different in size. So, the same query may give 5 uh, or whatever, 20 people in CS and 5 people in mechanical, simply because the mechanical people were in general older. So, these kinds of things cannot be helped. You have limited space and time to compute and store statistics. So, some estimates are going to be wrong. They are approximate, but that is the best you can do. So, then you can ask, well, if you are going to find the best plan based on wrong estimates, why even bother? You are wasting your time. The answer is, no, it is not so bad. They are sometimes wrong. Sometimes, they can be quite wrong, but practical experience is that even though statistics are approximate, what they are good at is eliminating very bad plans. So, given a query, there are a number of plans which are very bad. They are definitely going to be eliminated, even if your statistics are not quite accurate. Now, among the plans which are good, it may be that it will select a plan because its estimate was wrong. It selected a plan which is not quite the best plan, but practical experience is that most of the time the best plan is chosen. And even if the best actual best plan is not chosen, the plan which is chosen is close enough. People generally do not mind, you know, if it took one and a half times the time of the best possible plan, you know, does not really matter to most people. So, uh, as long as it is close enough, one and a half is still significant. If it is say 10 percent more, most people would not care. So, optimizers basically are good at finding plans which are, even if they are not exactly optimal, they are close to optimal. So, now, uh, the number of join orders which have to be considered, if you do it very naively, is factorial. I would not get into the exact formulae, but with n equal to 10, 10 relations, the number of different join orders is 176 billion. Now, enumerating so many is obviously going to take forever. So, you cannot really do this. You cannot enumerate it. So, the trick is to use dynamic programming. Now, if you have uh, uh, done algorithms courses, uh, you would have seen the term dynamic programming in there. Um, so, the same idea is used here to reduce the cost from this factorial 176 billion to something which is usually exponential, 2 power n or 3 power n. 2 power n is what? 1000. That is much, much less than a 176 billion. 3 power n is also not so small, but it is still handleable. So, how does this work? The idea is the following. To find the best plan for a set of n relations, consider all plans of the form S 1 join S minus S 1. What is S 1? For every S 1, which is a non-empty subset of S. So, I have some number of relations. I will take every subset, pull it off and consider any one such subset S 1. So, if I break up the plan like this with S 1 on the left and the remaining relations on the right, then 
the best plan for this set can be found by recursively computing the best plan for S 1 and the best plan for S minus S 1. So, the first step is to set up a recursive way of enumerating all plans. The second key idea of dynamic programming is that if I do this recursive setup, the same uh, optimization goal which is find the best plan for a particular set of relations will be invoked again and again. So, the same set of four relations may be a sub part of many, many, many different other plans. So, this thing to find the best plan for a set of four relations will be asked many times again and there are two key insights. The first is it does not matter what the plan is for the rest of the relations. The best plan for this four uh, is the only one we care about. If we have a plan for these four which is not the best plan that cannot form part of an overall best plan. So, for this sub goal for this set of four relations I can find the best plan and throw away all other plans. I do not even need to remember them. I will just record the best plan for this four relations and from that recursively I can build up the overall best plan. The second key insight is I need to compute this only once. The first time the optimizer recursively said find the best plan for this four relations, the query has 10 relations. So, for some four it says find the best plan. I will compute it and store it. The next time as part of some other uh, recursive call, the same thing is invoked again. I will say ah, I have already computed the best plan, I just need to retrieve it and return it. So, this step is what is called memoization or uh, is dynamic programming basically consists of remembering the best choice for something and if the same question is asked again, return that answer without again computing it. If you do this, the cost comes down drastically. So, let us uh, see that pseudo code. So, to find the best plan for S, if its cost is not infinity, what does that mean? We already computed it and stored it. So, initially all costs are set to infinity and if it is not infinity, we have stored it, we retrieve it and return it immediately. It is very fast. What if we have not computed it already? If S has only one relation, then it is just a question of taking whatever selections are there on S, applying them and that is the plan for S. There are a few tricks which uh, issues which I am going to ignore to keep life simple. So, the base case is one relation we are done. Just find the best way of accessing the data in that relation using whatever selections are there. Now, the recursive case is when S has more than one relation. So, now we are going to say for each non empty subset S 1 of S, which is not equal to S, it is not empty and it is not equal to S, we are going to recursively find the best plan for S 1, find the best plan for S minus S 1, that is the two parts S 1, S minus S 1 and we are going to do this for every possible S 1, but for a given S 1, I will find the two best plans recursively. Note that find best plan is the name of this procedure. So, this is actually a recursive call. So, uh, I have found this somehow recursively. Now, what do I do? For this S 1 partition uh, uh, joining with the remaining relations, I will find the best algorithm for joining those two. So, I will look at the alternatives hash join, merge join, index nested loop join, etcetera and I will estimate their cost and find the cheapest one. So, that is the algorithm I will plan to use and now the cost of this particular breakup using S 1 is the cost of the best plan uh, for S 1 which is P 1. So, P 1 dot cost plus the cost of P 2 which is the best plan for S minus S 1 plus the cost of the algorithm A which I just considered. So, that is here cost equal to P 1 dot cost plus P 2 dot cost plus the cost of A. So, that is the cost of the best way of doing it if I break up the relations into S 1 and everything else. Now, there are many ways of breaking it up into different S 1s. So, what I am doing here in this if statement is if cost is less than best plan S dot cost. So, remember this is a loop, it is doing it for every possible S 1. So, earlier in the loop I have tried some S 1 and first time around it will be the I will choose that one and store its cost. Now, what I am saying is if the cost of this alternative 
is less than the currently known best cost for the overall set S, then I will replace the best plan S dot cost that is the currently known best plan for S with the current plan which I am looking at. That is the cost and similarly the plan is execute P 1 dot plan, execute P 2 dot plan and join the results. Again there is pipelining and other issues which need to be taken into account. Uh, we will ignore those details for simplicity. Now that is it. We are actually done with algorithm. Uh, again there are some issues with sort orders and so on which I am going to ignore. Uh, but at its core this is the algorithm. This is a dynamic programming algorithm, but the question is what is its cost? It turns out that this cost is of the order of 3 power n and a lot of optimizers including the original system R said that 3 power n is still too high. Remember machines were a lot slower those days. So, what they did is instead of taking every subset S, they what they said is that I am um, going to take every relation or think of it as a subset of size 1 of S and then do the rest. Now, what does this correspond to? Let me show it pictorially. Pictorially, what system R does is it considers a class of joint trees which look like this. So, here each relation over here, each of these inputs is a relation and at the bottom this is a relation. So, look at this tree. For every operation, what is a node? It is a joint. So, this is a joint. Everything in here is a joint. Selections we are going to ignore for the moment. It is pushed down. These are relations. The leaves are relations. So, this kind of a joint tree is called a left deep joint tree. So, what is special about this? One of the inputs of every joint is a relation. So, what this means is system R will not consider trees which look like this. So, E 1, E 2, E 3, E 4, this is the joint tree which is not left deep. System R will not bother about these. It will only look at trees that look like this. And for this class of trees, it turns out that finding the best plan is cheaper. Instead of considering every subset S here, I will just consider singleton relations and it will simplify the plan, uh, the algorithm and it reduces the cost to much less. In fact, the cost for join order optimization with left deep joint trees is of the order of 2 power n. It is actually more like n into 2 power n, but it is still a fairly small number. So, for 10, it is 10 into 2 power 10, which is 10,000, which is quite cheap for a fast computer. Okay. So, this slide talked about left deep joint trees. R 1, R 2 up through R 5 and this is a non left deep joint tree. And this slide shows how to um, change the uh, algorithm to do left deep and it also talks about the sp space required. I am going to skip these details. Um, so, the bottom line what I just told you is if only left deep trees are considered the time complexity is n into 2 power n. I have a slide here on sort orders. For lack of time, I am going to skip it. And then I have several slides on statistics for cost estimation. Um, again, for lack of time, I am going to skip all of this. Um, you can read these offline. Uh, but I will note that the key statistics which are stored are number of tuples, that is a key one, number of blocks containing tuples of the data. If you recall, we used both of these in estimating the cost of joins and sorting and so on. And then the one important extra thing is the number of distinct values that appear for an attribute A in relation R, okay, which is the same as the size of project on A of R with eliminating duplicates. So, that is an important statistic, the number of distinct values. And many optimizers also use histograms, which is what is the distribution of values. So, for example, if you have a histogram on age attribute of some relation person, maybe it will look like this. You have so many from 1 to 5, so many from 6 to 10, so many from 11 to 15, then this and so forth. So, that is a histogram and histograms are very useful to estimate sizes of selection results and join results. 
So, again I am going to skip the details, there is a whole uh, bunch of formulae for estimating the size of selections, the size of joins, uh, the, uh, uh, the number of distinct values of selection results, join results, etcetera, etcetera. It is there, but most courses uh, which teach all of this in one semester probably will not be able to get into all the details. It takes a lot of time to cover all that. So, for a typical course, what I have covered today for optimization is probably what you will get time to cover in your class also.